Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for allowing me to interrupt the procedures for an introduction. Um, the month of March is music in our schools month. And coming down uh, from my district in, in Lewis County is the Beaver River Central School, uh, the Coraliers and their jazz ensemble. Um, uh, they live in the foothills of the Adirondack in Lewis County. Uh, their school district is about 900 students from K to 12, rural school district. And just uh, this last weekend in their area, Maple Weekend started. And I'm sure they all know that the Krogan Museum and Maple Museum is in their district. They're in their, near their school district. I was with the Ag Commissioner Ball uh, tapping trees on Saturday to, even though the, even though the sap's almost done, the commissioner and I were sort of untapping the trees, and uh, so we were there, and that's, uh, by the way, uh, New York is number two in maple production. Lewis County, where these people are from, are number one in the state in, mu in uh, maple production. So they're down here today, uh, not to talk about maple, but they performed down in the concourse earlier this afternoon. And the Beaver River School District consistently receives gold ratings from NESPA's festivals. They also, Beaver River regularly has students, vocal students, that are selected for the all-star uh, all ensembles. They're directed, they're cor the Coraliers are directed by Kendra Verkler, who's back there someplace, waving, and uh, Peter Wolf uh, Wolfslager, the director of the Jazz Ensemble. And I would like to uh, have you offer them the cordialities of the House, please, sir. Certainly, on behalf of Mr. Blankenbush, the Speaker, and all the members, we welcome this fine group of students here to the New York State Assembly. We also welcome your supervisors and your instructors. Uh, and being a fan of both maple syrup and jazz, I'm really happy to see you. So we extend to you the privileges of the floor. Congratulations. Keep up the good work. And we look forward to seeing you again. Mr. Morelli. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. If we could now uh, turn our attention to page 51 of the main calendar, and we will begin with calendar number 449 by Mr. Dendecker. Clerk will read. Assembly 4252B, calendar 449, Mr. Dendecker, an act authorizing the study of fees and charges assessed to residents of assisted living facilities. Read the last section. This act shall take effect immediately. Clerk will record the vote. Mr. Morelli. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Looks like a pretty full house here. So uh, I uh, would remind people this is our first vote of the day. If members would cast their votes, and uh, if we have any stragglers, we'd like to see them in the chamber so they might cast their first vote of the day. First vote of the day, members. Sound of our voice. Please come to the chambers and cast your vote. Thank you.
Are there any other votes? Announce the results. Ayes 121, noes 0. The bill is passed. Assembly 7749A, calendar 450. Ms. Pollan, an act to amend the environmental conservation law. The bill is laid aside. Assembly 9219, calendar 451. Mr. Zabrowski, an act to amend the environmental conservation law. Read the last section. This act shall take effect on the 30th day. The clerk will record the vote.
Are there any other votes? Shh. Announce the results. Ayes 121, noes 0. The bill is passed. Mr. Morelli. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, give some direction to the members on the next four bills that we will take up. Uh, they are as follows. Calendar number 414 on page 47 of the main calendar by Mr. Cahill, followed by calendar number one, I'm sorry, 415, calendar number 415 on page 47 by Mr. Titone. Uh, directly after that, we will take up calendar number 417 on page 48 by Mr. Scoofus. And in this uh, group, we will then take up calendar number 420 on page 48 by Mr. Kaminsky. Clerk will read. Assembly 1230A, calendar 414. Mr. Cahill, an act to amend the insurance law. An explanation is requested. Mr. Cahill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This bill would require the Superintendent of Financial Services within six months of the effective date of this bill to promulgate regulations which would standardize definitions to commonly, of commonly used terms and phrases found in homeowners policies and commercial line policies that provide coverage for loss or damage to real property, personal property, or other liabilities for loss or damage to property. Mr. Barkley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the sponsor yield? Will you yield, Mr. Cahill? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Sponsor yields. Thank you, Kevin. Mr. Barkley, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, I understand we've had this bill in the past. Is that correct? I recall the same as you, yes. Any changes in this bill from No changes in this bill. This is a bill we've been trying to will uh, turn into law since the big storms that affected us, Hurricane Lee and Irene and Sandy that did so much devastation all across the state of New York uh, and all of the things that we found out after those storms, which are becoming somewhat of a memory, but unfortunately we may encounter again given the dramatic weather we experience. So this is one of many measures we've been trying to see our way clear to becoming law, but something is apparently in the way of that. I think you mentioned in your explanation that this covers both uh, personal and commercial lines, is that correct? That is correct. So we could take the uh, personal lines part of that first. It's my understanding that uh, insurance policies now have to be written in a certain plain language, is that correct? That is correct. And so what's the difference, what's this require to make it plainer language? No, actually, well, that, that's an important point, Mr. Speaker. It's an important point to note that we already require insurance policies to be understandable by lay people. However, what we don't require is that insurance companies define those simple terms with the, in the same way. So you and I, Will, can each go out and get a, an insurance policy that has exactly the same language in it. And insurance company A might interpret it one way, and insurance company B may interpret it some way else. What we're suggesting is in certain instances, at the discretion of the superintendent, it may be appropriate for that superintendent to define specific terms in those plain language policies so we are all on the same page and we all know what we are talking about. But isn't, isn't traditionally, Kevin, that's the job of the courts? I mean, a lot of these definitions that are put in these policies have been litigated over years, over years, and finally, so people understand exactly what the definition means. I mean, isn't that the whole, you're an attorney. I I'm assume you've drafted contracts before. Kevin, how do you know what to write in that contract? How do you know what language to use? I use a variety of resources. And one of the resources I use is court precedent, and that's a very, very important resource. But sometimes it doesn't settle everything. And sometimes the terms that we're talking about don't necessarily rise to the level of litigation. And one thing we don't want to do with people who have been suffering under these dramatic natural disaster events that have been occurring with greater frequency and, 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 and greater force and ferocity is to make them now think, oh, okay, now I have to sue my insurance company when there's an easy fix. Let's let the superintendent define simple, easy terms that have plain meaning and let the superintendent decide which terms they should be so that our, our constituents, the ones that suffer from storms like Sandy, the ones that suffer from Lee and Irene, and by the way, as you and I both know because our communities have been affected by it, we can still go through our communities. Those storms, some of them five, six years old, are still having an impact on them. And why would we want to impose upon 
those people the need to go sue their own insurance company to define a word? Well, presumably they might have to sue them anyway. It's just because you're having DFS come in and define what the term means. Uh, how if you don't like how the DFS defines that? You're just stuck with that language, I guess? No, that's another good part of our bill. No, you're not stuck well, with it. Bring if, you're, good points for you, if, if you're an insurance company and you don't like the definition that the superintendent uses, then you are allowed to substitute your own definition so long as it is at least as favorable to the consumer or the business entity as the language that the superintendent chose. Well, currently you have to do that anyways. I think uh, as you read the contract, it has to be, if it's ambi uh, ambi if it's has ambiguity in it, it has to be read towards the insured, not the insurer, correct? Well, that this would add another dimension to that, yeah. uh, Mr. Speaker. Will. This would add the dimension of if an insurance company felt that the superintendent was not strong enough in their protection of consumers, they themselves could write language that, that, that's stronger. And by the way, this is not a hypothetical. As you well know from our roundtables and hearings on Sandy, we graded our insurance companies. Most got a grade in the 90s. That means they almost did it exactly right. Some got grades that hovered very close to 100. Those are the insurance companies that may very well choose to add a definition that is even more favorable to consumers than that which the law would provide under this section. During all those hearings and roundtables that we had after the Sandy Storm, can you point to a specific term or phrase that was ambiguous, had ambiguity to it that I, uh, needs to be clarified by DF, DFS? Once again, that's a very important question, and my recollection, as unclear as it is on so many things, is perfectly clear on what we uncovered in those roundtables and hearings. And the answer to your question is yes. Can you share with the chamber what the Oh, you want actual examples? Oh, yes. For example, hurricane trigger. You know, we had the concept of what is a hurricane. Who thought that was a, a term we would need to have defined? But you know what happened? Some insurance companies defined it in terms of where that storm landed. And if it landed in the water, it was not called a hurricane. It was called something else that only meteorologists ever referred to it as. And others were, were treated to some less uh, pervasive definition that prevented it from happening. And then we had something else called the uh, anti-concurrent causation clauses that existed in contracts. And they were oftentimes interpreted in a very, very arcane way to deprive people who had already been victimized by a natural disaster of the insurance company, of the insurance coverage that they rightfully paid for. I believe we have a number of bills, Kevin, that address both those uh, issues, correct? And Indeed, they may we be on do. The this today, is the first of many. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Thank on, you, Mr. Speaker. On the bill, please. On the bill. I mean, a lot of these terms and phrases, they can get uh, unclear, maybe to the consumers, but as attorneys, we know we craft contracts because words have meaning. And often these meanings for these words are defined over several years through much litigation. If we all of a sudden say that DFS now has to start defining words, we're basically throwing out years of litigation to get these means of these words together and then instituting the DFS judgment. I think this is just going to create additional litigation in the future years to try to decide exactly what the DFS it means by trying to find these terms and phrases in uh, insurance contracts. So for those reasons, Mr. Speaker, and many other reasons, I'd urge my colleagues to vote no on this bill. Thank you. Read the last section. This act shall take effect immediately. The clerk will record the vote.